speaker, I just want to tell you a little bit about next week so that you might come back. Um, the Tamarisk Coalition is based out of Grand Junction, and they do a lot of restoration work on the rivers, uh, the big rivers, uh, in on the Colorado River and out towards Moab. And they, um, they're going to be presenting on the effectiveness of restoration. And kind of some of, kind of like when you let the beetles go, to kill all the tamarisk, is that a good thing? Or does it actually cause other problems? And so they're going to talk about that from the, um, looking at restoration and see if it, how well it's actually working. So I'm really excited about that one, and I hope you'll come back. But tonight, we also have another water-related one. And if you know me very well, you know I, I have an affinity for water. Um, tonight is the most special, for me, it was the most exciting one of, one of the natural sites to schedule. Um, this is the very first topic that I thought was important for this year. I actually thought of this back in September. I was like, we got to get the Mountain Studies Institute here to share what they were able to accomplish um, with collecting data on animus after the mine spill. And so you might have read in the paper that Marcy was going to come and she's the executive director of the organization, but she actually wasn't able to come. Instead, kind of going back to our original plan, though, Scott Roberts is here and he's the water program director for the Mountain Studies Institute, which is based in Durango. And Scott has over 10 years of experience as an aquatic ecologist, field biologist, and GIS analyst. Um, he's worked all over the country. He does come originally from Tennessee, and we're going to Appalachian State, not, not said any other way. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, his graduate research examined the loss of the eastern hemlock from riparian forests of the southern Appalachian mountains um, within the broader context of aquatic ecology, spatial analysis, and watershed resources. He's also spent time at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab, um, and he spent time in California and all over the country doing different kinds of water watershed science. And he was able to come today. And so without further ado, I will let um, him have the stage. And when we're doing the question and answers later this, half, this evening, we'll make sure we use this microphone that doesn't project, but it does record for grassroots. So that, here's Scott. Thank you. Okay, hey guys. Can you hear me? Am I too loud, too quiet? Somewhere in between. I'll just try this. And uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Scott Roberts. I'm an aquatic ecologist for the Mountain Studies Institute and really happy to come up here. Not only is it beautiful, but you guys gave me an excuse to go have some of my favorite Mexican food in the state at, at Garcia's. And uh, that place is awesome. And uh, also, I have a uh, two month old son, my first son. and he came up here with me, and this is the furthest he's ever been from Durango in his short life so far, so what a cool place for him to come his first time. Um, I'm going to be talking about, obviously, uh, Mountain Studies Institute's monitoring of, of uh, the Animus River during this uh, Gold King incident. And uh, man, it's really taken over our lives and a lot of people's lives in Durango and been a big ordeal, so I'll try to keep my talk within the time frame, but maybe keep me honest somewhere in there because there's a lot to talk about. Um, I would like to tell you a little bit about my organization first. Uh, the Mountain Studies Institute, we're a, an independent, not-for-profit uh, research and education center based in the San Juan Mountains. We have an office in Durango, which is where I work, and we also have an office in Silverton, uh, just north in the San Juan Mountains. And, it's really interesting. I think that there's probably a lot of room for collaboration within this room and within your community with, Mount, with our organization. The, the parallels are striking as uh, we, our office in Durango is actually in a renovated school building just like this. It's almost uncanny. Like there is a dance studio and it's really similar and funny that this is here. And also in Durango, Colorado, I live at 521 East 3rd Street. And this is five, anyway, really weird. <laughs> but, so, yes, the Smiley Building, absolutely. Folks here familiar with Durango? Oh, good, yeah. So, uh, Mountain Studies Institute, we have kind of a, a number of things that we do, of course, but I'll tell you about three kind of broad things. We provide education opportunities and internships. Uh, for example, we facilitate an internship program 
uh, linking college students with federal agencies. They can have summer internships with the BLM or uh, the Forest Service or Park Service, and it allows them to have some kind of experience within federal agencies to see if they would want to pursue a career uh, down that path. We also uh, develop a supplemental curriculum for local classrooms. Uh, we have a program called My Water Comes from the San Juan Mountains that kind of people use in, in, in the classroom. We help with science fair, those sort of things. Um, we do a lot of collaborative, eff collaborative eff efforts within communities between stakeholders and, and scientists and the public. Uh, for example, in the southeastern San Juans in Pagosa Springs, we have a program where um, we are uh, basically collaborating with all the involved parties with the spruce beetle uh, mortality that's occurring there and how that affects communities and trying to get everybody on the same page with what the Forest Service is now doing for um, uh, the thinning or, or fire mitigation and what practices they can take on as a community together. And then we conduct monitoring and research and that's what, of course, I'll be talking about today. So, here's a quick outline of what I'll be talking about. So, uh, I'll give you some kind of background context and then I'll tell you about our initial observations, you know, seeing water turn from that clear to that orange, what we initially saw in the water quality and aquatic life. And then I'll talk about our continuing monitoring through the fall, um, water quality after that, that orange came through and then storm events after that, and then long-term impacts to aquatic life. So let me just start with this image and how many of uh, you folks have seen a picture of the Animus River when it turned orange, either on the internet or um, pretty much everybody in this room? Did anybody not see or know about this story? It was, you know, it was on national and international news, and even our local breweries made a, a beer, a special beer in honor of it, called the Heavy Metal EPA. <laughs> it's not, not Environmental Protection Agency, that, not that EPA, but the Extra Pale Ale, and it was a nice cloudy cloudy orange beer. <laughs> they did a nice thing. They, they donated the profit, the profits, the proceeds to uh, the really perhaps the, the biggest impact of this event was on tourism and, and recreation companies that, that provided rafting. And they really lost a lot of business. So let me just give you some context. So here's the Animus River. If you're not familiar with it, it flows from the San Juan Mountains. Um, near Silverton, down through Durango, it flows to the south, and then across the state line into New Mexico, and with the confluence of the San Juan River in Farmington. And all those yellow dots up there are, are mines, and that's not all of them. There's actually many more than are depicted here. But the Gold King Mine, which is really called Gold King Number no. 7 level, is located way up there in the top of the watershed in the headwaters above Silverton. And if you can see, I'll talk about Durango. A lot of our monitoring was done in Durango, and you can see it's about 60 miles, actually, from uh, the Gold King Mine down, river miles downstream to Durango. So this is zoomed in uh, around Silverton. And the Gold King Mine is located up, up here. And this is a highly mineralized zone known as the Silverton Caldera. And there's a lot of naturally occurring minerals there. That's why people were mining there for a long time. But those natural occurring minerals um, naturally uh, put a lot of metals in the, in the rivers anyway. And then mining came along and exasperated it. So what's going on is, is we've got degraded water quality uh, in a lot of these creeks. And these are the three main, main drainages up there, Mineral Creek, Cement Creek, and the upper Animus River. And the Gold King is within Cement Creek. And Water quality has been so bad, uh, really, for probably 100 years that Cement Creek, due to natural metals and, and mining-related metals, has likely never had aquatic life. It's probably always, even before humans, been dead. There's a few midges living in there, but not much. And then downstream of Silverton, in this stretch of the Animus River, is, there used to be a fishery, and there's not much of one for several miles downstream, and that's mostly from mining. So there's a group called the Animus River Stakeholders Group that started a number of years ago, and they've uh, really tried to tackle uh, taking on uh, this, this degraded water quality up there. 
and they've done a lot of cool restoration and remediation projects, but one of the most useful things they did was they asked the question, okay, well, there's a lot of metals in the river. Uh, where did they come from? We know that some of them are from mines, but what mines specifically? Because we want to clean it up. So which mines should we concentrate on? And what they found actually was kind of surprising. They found that of zinc, which is often used to kind of represent metals because it persists for a long time for mines, they found that the majority, 75% of the zinc load in the Animus River could be attributed to only four mines. And there's 186 mines they sampled up there. So really that allowed them to focus on just a few mines instead of all 186. And you'll notice what the, the mines that are up there, American Tunnel, Red and Benita, the Mogul, and then of course the Gold King. So here we are zoomed in to this area. Um, and you'll notice all four of those mines are within Cement Creek, and not only are they within that one watershed, they're actually all draining this Bonita Peak area. And this Bonita Peak, I think you'll hear this name a bunch in the future. But have anybody, anyone ever skied uh, Silverton Ski Mountain in this room? Oh, one, all right, yeah, it's a, it's a nice steep uh, ski run. And actually, let's see. So that is this purple arrow, arrow. The ski lift comes up right here, and when you ski off the top of Silverton Ski Mountain, you actually ski these shots and these shots, and you come down right on American Tunnel, and you catch the bus right in here, back around to the lift. And so if you've ever been there, you've seen these mines. Also, if you ever go out on this ridge and ski these north-facing trees, it's a great backcountry ski run called Mini Ha Ha, which is almost as fun to say as it is to ski. I just like going to Minnehaha, but if you go there, you're skiing down and you're looking right at this Gold King mine. So it's, an, it's a remote part of Colorado, but you know, there's a lot of recreation and a lot of use around there. And I could go on and on, there's actually a lot of good skiing in the area, but <laughs> <laughs> that's not the point of this talk. So one thing you'll also notice if you read topo lines is that the American Tunnel is located kind of down in this drainage, and these other mines are all upslope. Here's a schematic that kind of shows that. This is from the Colorado Division of Mining, Reclamation, and Safety, and you can see American Tunnel down at the bottom, Red and Benina, Gold King, and the Mogul higher up. Now, Sunnyside Gold is a corporation that, that uh, owned and operated the American Tunnel and not the Gold King and not the Red and Benita, but the American Tunnel. And they wanted to leave the area and not mine anymore after about the 1990s. And so they entered an agreement with the state of Colorado to try to figure out how they could leave the area and clean up their mess and, and be gone. And part of their negotiations and agreement was to put a bulkhead into the American Tunnel. And again, remember all four of these mines were draining a lot of metals just out their adits, out the portal, out the hole, down into the creeks. And the American Tunnel, uh, so they wanted to put a bulkhead in it, and it looks like that. It's basically like an engineered metal plug, if you will, and it just keeps the water from coming out of there anymore and getting into Cement Creek. Um, and then, over the next few years, actually water that was coming out of Red and Benita, Gold King, and the Mogul Mines all started to increase in flow. And one hypothesis is that when you plug uh, the American Tunnel. Think of it like closing the front door of a house that's filling with water and then the water keeps going up. I heard this analogy from someone else and I thought it was a good one, but that maybe higher up the water kept going and then coming out the, f the doors and windows on the second and third floor were the Red and Benita and Gold King. So I'm going to start a little video What is the pipe? Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Sorry. I have to ask an engineer. <laughs> so this is actually, some of you may have seen, this is on the internet and available. If we can get it to play. This is footage from the contractors who were there in August uh, of last year. And this is the Gold King mine. And so they had bulkheaded American Tunnel and bulkheaded the Mogul mine and the other mine, the Red Benita, they were up there installing a bulkhead on that. And then this mine, the Gold King, was 
a collapsed mine, so there was debris and soil covering it. And so they were trying to get in there to, to explore the mine and see what they could do. See how, they, did, they didn't know how much water was back there, and they basically wanted to try to clean it up. Now, unfortunately, when they were moving the debris, as you can see, water burst through and started coming out. And this is the start of this whole event. No, they, this is a, a video that is not very kind to the uh, contractors. But the, <laughs> what's interesting though is, is that a lot of people don't quite understand what the orange was in the river. And it's, some people think that it's chemicals or something that they put back in the mine. And it's not. It's actually just that there were tunnels there and, and water naturally percolated through the mountain and filled the tunnels and then metals leached into that water. The other thing that complicates is, it, is if you look at the water gushing out of there, it's also eroding the, the land going down to, to Cement Creek and picking up old mine waste rocks with it. Yeah. So not only is it the water that was backed up in the tunnels and the, the mines, but it's also picking up things uh, on the way down to the creek and then resuspending metals that have been laid for a long time in the creek beds. And so this water flowed down this mountainside, down into Cement Creek, down Cement Creek to the town of Silverton. Luckily, no one was hurt along the way. Down into the Animus River, down the Animus River uh, to Durango, Colorado, and, uh, and then down, as I said, down to the San Juan and on the Lake Powell. A little bit. For a long time? Yeah, a long time water had been coming out of all four of those mines. It's kind of changed over the years uh, due to the how much snow we got, things like that. I don't understand how you could think you could plug something up that water's constantly collecting and then not have it burst someday. I mean, that, one. That's a great <laughs> comment, and, and I, can, I think I can actually speak to that. Uh, that it's been successful elsewhere is the, is the easy answer, really? even in the same area. So it's not. It may seem stupid, but uh, it has worked in other places. But so, why don't we go ahead and and move to me and 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 Mount Studies Institute and what we did? Um, here is uh, the Animus River before that plume came through. So that uh, that event occurred. That's the video you just saw on August fifth, and on August sixth, the morning of, is when I first got word. We started getting calls. Um, that something had happened, and, and we'd been studying, you know, the river and metals and, and the bugs and the water quality for a while, so I was floored when we heard about this. And the sheriff immediately closed the river to recreation, and, I, you know, people, there was, it caused a panic, as you can imagine, seeing some of these pictures before it actually came to Durango. And remember, Durango's uh, 60 miles downstream, so we had time before it got there. And so, as a scientist, I, and my colleagues, we immediately just started brainstorming and designing a, a monitoring program that we could, we could start. And so luckily our office is only a few blocks from the river. And these are the questions we initially were asking. We saw pictures even before we were able to see it with our own eyes. And we were like, what's in the plume? You know, of course, who, everybody wants to know what is in the plume, what is the orange, and, um, the, and what, is, uh, what, what will happen to the fish and the bugs and aquatic life. So we went down to the river and started grabbing samples. Uh, you can see that clear sample, that's before the plume came through town. And uh, of course we were gonna wait and get one during the plume and, and, and on and on. And that's a picture of uh, actually me collecting uh, insects from the bottom of the stream to see so that we knew if they were gonna still be alive after the orange came through. And so we, we sampled and then we waited. And because the river actually goes through a, a canyon in between Silverton and Durango, it came real fast through the canyon to, to a place called Baker's Bridge. But then after that, it enters this agricultural valley where it's flat, slow-moving meanders. And that took a long time, longer than a lot of people uh, were guessing. And so this, people started getting off work and lining the banks of the river and bridges, waiting to watch this event unfold. And I was texting buddies that lived upstream. Is it there yet? Is it there yet? And, and, uh, 
eventually it got dark and we actually didn't get to uh, see it during the daylight, but we stood out on this bridge into the night with flashlights watching for the river to change color. And eventually it did. At about 10.30 at night is when um, it turned orange. Was anybody here actually in Durango at that time? Seems like it could have happened. Okay, so at about 10.30 at night, we're standing there with flashlights, it turns orange. And it was surreal, as you can imagine, watching you know, a river that you love change color like that and, and wondering and being fearful of everything that could happen. And especially having it, having it happen at night was even crazier. Was so, the water like there before the plume, was it really healthy and good fishing right there? And that, kind of that's opening a, a, I could give a lecture just on that. <laughs> but let's say uh, that there is a, a good fish population that's there. It's not currently reproducing to the potential that we would like. Um, but there are, there's a good fishery, it's good for fishing, and the bugs are pretty healthy and really dense, definitely dense. So good reason to think that we'd see an impact. Um, of course, our immediate concerns were drinking water, uh, recreation, because Durango, of course, a lot of our tourism is based on the train that runs up the river and also people rafting and tubing and fishing. And there is agriculture north of town in the, in the Animas Valley, and then of course aquatic life. So that, by the way, is the sample from the taken at like one or two in the morning in the dark. The left obviously was before and then during. So still, what was in the plume? And what's interesting to me looking back at this whole thing is it wasn't actually immediately answerable. To test for metals and, and water quality, as some of you may know, it actually takes some time. Um, typically in a lab, it's like a week to two week turnaround. You can pay for it to be expedited you know, and, and as quickly as maybe 24 to 48 hours. But so samples took time and I think it caused a lot of frustration and concern among the, amongst the community. And we would have these community meetings that next day, next couple of days, and it got pretty heated and it was, it was a tough, it was really, really difficult for our community. I had a woman come to me and just tears in her eyes and she just had a, her son and was, lived on the banks of the river and was worried that her son would never be, it would never be safe for her son to, to live, to, sorry, to swim in the river. And it was just heartbreaking to hear all these concerns before we really knew the extent of what had happened. But one thing we could do while we were waiting on the lab results for, for water quality is, is do some really basic science, right? We just went and looked what's living in the water before it happened and what's living there afterwards. And so we did these kind of pre and post plume assessment of, uh, of, of insects, of benthic macroinvertebrates. And just so we're all on the same page, let's just talk briefly about what benthic macroinvertebrates are. Um, how many of you folks fish? All right, then you definitely know these are basically fish food. Um, benthic, it just means they live on the bottom. They live in the substrate and the rocks and the gravel and the muck on the bottom of, of rivers and lakes. Macro, they, they're visible to the human eye. They're not microscopic. Um, and they don't have a backbone. And more importantly, probably, they're excellent indicators of water quality. If you think about it, you go grab a, just kind of a sample of water at any one point in time. It's really that sample is only reflective of the water quality at that hour or that day. Whereas these insects are really tied to that habitat. They're living in the, in the water column as well as in the sediments. And some of them live uh, for months and even a few years that they would spend in that water. So the, the community that you observe there is reflective of more long-term water quality trends. And because they're so diverse, there's so many different kinds of them, there's a diversity in their tolerance to pollution. So some of them really thrive in the nastiest muck and others are uh, only like to live in the nicest, pristine, well oxygenated water. So this, these five here, guys here, this is kind of like the cast of characters of, of the most common insects in the, in the Animus, Animus River. Um, you've got a Brachiocentris, that's an American log cabin case caddisfly. Uh, a Betis is a fisherman called blue-winged olive. Um, it's a mayfly. Hydrocycid is a net-spinning caddis. Orthocladonate, it's a subfamily, subfamily of midges and some mealium or black flies. And so these are kind of, I was familiar with what lived there after, 
working in, in the Animus for a few years, and so I knew kind of what it would look like, and, and I think I would be able to tell if things changed. But let's, um, let's look at some of these guys more up close. So, I used to work in the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Lab, and when we had a little bit of time, we used to make videos. And these are, uh, <laughs> these are black flies, um, simulium, and they basically have a bulbous in on their, on their bottom, on the butt, and they attach themselves to rocks in really fast flowing riffles. And then they have a fan kind of on top of their head, and they're taking that pro leg and uh, cleaning off the fan, and the fan is collecting particulate matter as it comes down really fast in riffles, and they're cleaning that fan with their pro leg, and that's, that's how they eat. But they're awesome. And then uh, we'll watch another one while we're at it. This is the net spinning caddisfly, uh, Ceratopsyche, but really Hydropsyche is the one that, uh, a cousin that lives in, in the river in Durango. So just for scale, those are sand grains that it's moving. So this is pretty small. And it's building itself a, a retreat that it'll live in. And caddisflies, most of them have a retreat. The, and they either live in it like a turtle and they always stay in it and move it around with them. Like this Brachiocentris, this uh, American log well, cabin case builder back there. And this guy builds the hydrocycle here, the net spinning is, he builds kind of a fixed retreat and then he goes out and back in it. So you'll see, as he's building his case, this uh, American log cabin case building caddis is gonna wander, wander up and you'll get to see him defend his territory. These uh, log cabin case builders, the reason that they call them that is, if you look at their case, it's perfectly tapered as it gets uh, toward the opening. And the way they do that is as the insect grows, its arm span grows. And so at one point it'll, and it makes those cases out of like grass, for example. And it'll take a, a blade of grass and extend it as far as it can with one arm and then bite it off. And so the length of that case is the length of his arm span. And as his arm gets longer, the, the length of blade of grass gets longer. And so that's how it gets tapered. I'm gonna fast forward. There we go. Whoop. So there's the guy with the tapered case that's fixed and he carries around like a turtle. And then the net spinning caddisfly is gonna say, hey, get out of here. And it's, I'm not sure what happens here. One of them bites the other, or it seems startled. He almost seems stunned, and then the, the other guy, the brachiocentrist, runs off. But anyway, it's an interesting and crazy world out there. And just some killer music. <laughs> so, back to the animus. Um, as I said, we did you know just some basic science just before and after the 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 Gold King release, and I'm going to call that the plume from now on for the rest of this talk. Just the plume this makes it easier. Um, so, what would I expect to see from metals uh, on the insect? On the what kind of impacts do uh, metals have on aquatic life? Well, there's direct effects that cause direct toxicity, and a lot of times it's things like iron uh, that's that precipitates actually out on the body of these organisms. This is a net spinning caddisfly that we just watched in the video. Uh, and its thoracic segment here should be dark, but it's covered in kind of orange iron precipitates. And those precipitates can interfere with respiration, uh, cause gill damage, and just stress them out to where it could kill them that way. Or there's indirect effects. The same way that precipitates would precipitate out on an insect, they also precipitate out on the bottom of a stream. And these insects like to live in the nooks and crannies in between rocks. And when those nooks and crannies get smothered in precipitates, then they're basically displacing their habitat and then they have nowhere to live. And, and how we would see that is, well, maybe the insects would just be gone, they'd be just killed, or we'd find them dead. Or 
we can look at community composition, um, what species make up that community. And like I mentioned before, there's, there's sensitive species that we could look for to see if perhaps one or two species disappeared where the rest of the community remained intact. And you can see those different changes in, in community structure using different statistical metrics. So we watched the, the, the plume come through in the middle of the night and then got up the next day and of course we're just wanting to know what happened and I was curious if things survived. So went down to the river and, and took a sample and this is what we, we found, which was that a lot of insects were still alive. And really, all the kind of dominant taxa I just described, the co most common insects, here you can see this betis mayfly. There's these um, simulium black flies with the bulbous ends, and that brachycentris with the tapered case. And they were all still there, and actually in the densities that I was accustomed to seeing. So really good news. I was, I almost cried, I was like so happy to see them still alive. That is a great hypothesis. And then looking for uh, sensitive species, maybe that aren't common, that are larger, more sensitive organisms. This is a Terranarces stonefly, a salmon fly, I think that fly fishermen call them. And uh, they're the largest and, and perhaps one of the most sensitive organisms in the, anima, in the Durango stretch of the Amish River. And, and again, you know, dipping nets and finding these guys alive was really encouraging. You know, after the fact, now it seems like, oh, well, whatever, you know, their insects were alive a day after. But at the moment, it was really, really exciting. And because we didn't have results back from the laboratory, it was something that we could offer the community a little bit of hope. Here's what that looks like, a simple metric of, of just diversity, the number of species um, before and after at four different sites. And actually, these first two on the left, Third Street and Rotary Park, that was my data. And then these AR sites are actually data from the Southern Ute Indian Tribe, and they were doing the same thing at the same time. And the fact that our data, we actually found pretty similar things, and that the blue bar was the day before the plume, the orange bar was the day after. And what you see actually is no large decrease in diversity. That's what we would expect to see is a tall blue bar, and then all of a sudden that orange bar would be really much shorter, and that's not what we saw. We actually saw a, at 32nd Street a slight decrease, but that could be due to sampling error, it's a sampling error or variability. But then at Rotary Park, we saw more species after the plume, and the Southern Utes saw the same thing, more species at one site and uh, the same at another. So usually when I'm there on the banks of the river looking at insects, I've got buckets and, and pans and uh, nets and there's always like this has happened a number of times now there's a miscommunication of somebody thinking that I'm panning for gold and I think that they know what I'm talking about and they're like hey are you, are you finding anything and I'm like yeah all sorts of things and, and then they come running because they think I found gold and I'm like see insects and they're like confused but anyway this was the one time where people knew exactly what I was doing and they knew I was checking on the the river and uh, it ended I ended up being interviewed because media came to town, I ended up uh, on CBS Morning, Good Morning America, I was on NBC, ABC, NPR. I got interviewed by Al Jazeera. It was crazy. But, and then along comes the, the governor, that's uh, Governor Hickenlooper there. And I spent a moment with him uh, explaining the importance of benthic macroinvertebrates and, and what we'd found, which was fun. And uh, not an hour after I talked to him and told him the good news that some things were alive, but expressed caution, as I will, that, that we really don't know the long-term effects still. But about an hour after I talked to him, you may have seen, seen him on the news. Oh, he's drinking water from, straight from the Amish River uh, as a statement of that maybe things are okay. I love this caption that they use, river not as orange today. <laughs> That's so encouraging. So to be fair, there, there was a lot of data coming out at that point. This was about two or three days after the spill. And for example, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife had placed some fish in cages right in the Animus River right before the plume came through and left them in there for a few days. And they actually had similar good news in that 207 of their 208 fish that they put in there survived. 
And then they followed that up with an annual fish shocking survey where they compared the fish population after this gold king to the, their observations from 2014, the year before. And they actually found an increase in biomass and a slight increase in fish greater than 14 inches. And then at that, about that same time, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment took some fish tissue analysis, fish tissue and had it analyzed and found that, safe, that fish were safe to eat. And this is what we're seeing, kind of a chronology of, of the change in the, in the water color. There's August 7th on the, on the top, which would be the day, the first daylight of the plume in Durango. And then a couple of days later, a couple of days later, you can see it turning from orange to yellow to green, to kind of back to what we typically see. So it happened pretty quick. So we started getting uh, water quality results back. And we had our water uh, samples analyzed for 24 different metals and minerals. And as you can imagine, the difference between the clear and the orange bottle here, we saw really large increases in almost all metals and minerals. Really large increases, like lead increased by 175,000%. Iron increased by 80,000%. Zinc, arsenic, aluminum, really big increases. And this is what that, that looks like on a, on a graph. On the x-axis here on the bottom is time in days. And then uh, if you look, let's look first at the orange lines with the dots, that's pH. And during the plume, you see in the very beginning this really sharp drop from a pH of about 7.5 to 6.8. And again, this is Durango. And then uh, the, the gray graph, or the gray line with dots is lead. And you can see at the same time the pH dropped, it, it went really high. But then went right back to about where we saw it before. And here's what that looks like at, at a, several sites. This is using our data on the bottom and then uh, data that EPA collected. And what you can see is that spike that we saw in the other one. Uh, it moves downstream and it's staggered. So the first, this yellow spike is Cement Creek. And remember, that's the creek that, that the Gold King went directly into. And then the, the red line is the Animus below Silverton. So that's the next one. And then the Animus at Baker's Bridge is further downstream. So that green spike is a little bit delayed. And then the blue at the bot, uh, was our site in Durango, again, uh, that occurred after the others. So it happened as it, as it makes sense. And what's interesting is it, it spiked up and then came back near the level where it started. So this was all we really knew after a few days. And what this resulted in really was just a really large increase in more questions. And so what I'm going to do now is, is fast forward to now. And I'm going to describe what we know now uh, as far as the rest of our monitoring results and frame it into these questions that, that we still had. So metals were high. I showed you those really large increases in metals, but what does that mean? And does it actually mean anything to aquatic life or human health? What's going to happen when we have storm events? Will the, the sediment that got laid down be resuspended and, and have it, these large peaks of uh, metals again in the river? And if aquatic life initially survived, how will it fare in the long run? Is it just because it survived? That's one thing. And yeah, that's encouraging, but is it... Uh, is it functioning to its full uh, capacity? Will they reproduce? Will we see future generations of these insects surviving down the road? And, and also, is there bioaccumulation occurring? Are these, are these insects surviving but uptaking so much metals that they're going to pass that on to fish and, and birds? So I'll start with these first two questions and more about water quality. So we collected over the course of August 6 to October 26, over 130 different water quality samples from, from Rotary Park in Durango. And we, to tell, you know, we had these large increases and we wanted to know why, you know, whether they were, what they meant. And so what we did was compare them to, to state and federal water quality standards and screening levels. And so there's drinking water quality standards, there's agricultural water quality standards, standards for aquatic life and recreation. 
And I'm going to take you through an example of what that looks like to, to look at that data and compare it to water quality standards. So here's the, the hydrograph for the Animus River from, from last year. And you can see, like a lot of rivers in the West, we have a huge uh, runoff period associated with snowmelt that occurs in June. And then in the fall, we have these uh, storm of, small monsoonal storm events. And so the plume occurred, actually, the river had already come all the way back down from snowmelt. And actually, there had even been one monsoonal storm event and it happened right about there. And then we were really concentrating our continued monitoring on these two storm events. We were trying to capture what would happen when the river level rose again. So here's zoomed into that. And we're going to use look at total aluminum as an example. And so there you see the plume, uh, those two storms, the hydrographs at the bottom. Uh, you've got August, September, and October on the bottom axis. And then metal concentration, actually the concentration of aluminum is what that is on the vertical axis. So I'm going to throw some water quality standards on the graph and then we'll compare the total aluminum to those that we observed. So the first one is an EPA recreational screening level. And what that is is the EPA at the time, um, they, they came up with a screening level specifically for the Animus River that was meant to represent at a level that if you drink water anywhere below that level, you wouldn't expect to have adverse impacts. If you drank that water for 16 weeks, two liters a day for 16 weeks, for a year for 30 years. So it's pretty conservative. They're saying you would need to drink two liters of water a day for 16 weeks every year for 30 years anywhere in here and you wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a harm to your health. So that's what that standard is. Yeah. So, and then there's other standards. An EPA set for aluminum, and again, these are all specific to aluminum. The EPA secondary drinking water standard for aluminum is, is much lower, but it's not a human health-based standard. It's actually an aesthetic standard. It's for the taste or the color of water. For aluminum, for example, the concern is it would stain your appliances. And then we have aquatic life standards. And there's two for aluminum. There's an acute standard, so that's for these that's meant for these kind of short-term brief events like this Gold King release. Uh, and then there's a chronic standard that is meant to represent um, a more long-term exposure. And then here's what we observed for aluminum over that time period. That's this black line I threw up there. And you can see during the plume, the orange kind of thing here, huge spike in aluminum. And then it dropped down pretty quick. And then there was kind of some variability in here in August before it came down here. And then these breaks were just sampling breaks because it got expensive. So we really were trying to target specific periods for this time period. But you can see it, it actually surpassed during the plume uh, this, this secondary drinking water standard, the chronic standard for aquatic life, and the acute standard for aquatic life. It didn't quite make it to this recreation standard. And then during plume, you see the aluminum actually came up quite a bit, as we feared. But it wasn't nearly as high as, uh, as over here. And these, these graphs, that scale is logged, so it's a little misleading in that this actually is much higher than that. But the good news there is that we didn't hit, quite hit these uh, aquatic life standards during the storm events. So instead of going through every single 20, all 24 metals and minerals for these different water quality standards, I'll just kind of summarize it for you. Uh -huh. What location was that? That was, so I'm mostly talking about Durango. Okay. Most of our data is, is from Durango, at least for water quality. There is data from the EPA and, and actually tribes from other locations. At what depth do you take that? Uh, that sample is taken from a riffle, so it's, it's, um, it's not very deep, probably uh, six inches, but it's only like a foot deep. So something like that. So there's bad news, good news, and uncertainty to, to basically our analysis of, of the water quality standards. The bad news is that there was a number of exceedances, and these yellow Ys are, uh, are exceedances of water quality standards for the different metals. And you don't need to read too much into it. And then the blue one, the blue Y, 
is for storm events. So the bolder color uh, can, is distinguished between these asterisks. The asterisks are for standards like a chronic standard, which is for agriculture and for aquatic life, and actually this domestic drinking water supply is a chronic standard. And what I mean by that is they're, they're meant to, you really need to have a, a concentration of a metal that persists for 30 days for a long period of time before you have a legitimate exceedance of that water quality standard. That's not true of, of the acute water quality standard. That's just basically one sample. And so there's more emphasis on, on these uh, acute standards that because it was a brief event, as you saw with aluminum, it really only exceeded that standard for a matter of hours, not the 30 days which are required by these, by these standards. But so the good news, the bad news is there were uh, water quality exceedances. I'm particularly concerned with this aluminum that was so high and it, and it exceeded this acute uh, standard. Good news is that there weren't any other exceedances of the acute standard during the plume or during the storm events. And there wasn't any exceedances during the storm events for agriculture or for recreation. So what this tells you is it, it probably wasn't a good idea to go swimming during the orange plume. It probably wasn't a good idea. And it may be detrimental to aquatic life for this aluminum. So I think looking at the hydrograph is, a, is an interesting exercise for moving forward. If you look at the, the, the level of discharge when the Gold King actually happened, it was about here. And so these storm events that we measured actually weren't didn't reach that level yet. And if, when you think about that plume came through, it was depositing a lot of sediment with it, not only on the, mar on the bottom of the river, but on the margins. And so really since this, this occurred, the river hasn't gotten to that level yet. And so we still have a lot of concern about those sediments being re re-stirred up uh, with bigger events, especially this coming spring when this occurs and moves all that material from the 100 miles of river further downstream. So let's move on to, um, to this next question. And basically, yeah, we know that fish and bugs survived, but, but what's going to happen to their future generations? And long story short, we're about to find out. We're actually due, uh, due to have this written up, and, and we're analyzing those results as we speak, and we'll have it in April. But just so you know, we. Here we have uh, actually samples from below Durango all the way up to above Silverton of benthic macroinvertebrates, those bugs, to look at and analyze their community composition to see if their structure changed and also the tissue of those bugs to see if that changed, the concentration of metals in their tissue. Luckily, I last year in, in 2014 did this exact same study on the Animus River, these 15 same sites. I got tissue sampling from 2014 and community sampling. So we're gonna have a direct comparison to be able to see uh, what happened. So it was really, we were lucky to have that data. So keep, keep your eye out for, we'll try to get this data into people's hands. But what might we see with that data, just real briefly, uh, mayflies are, are largely considered a, an indicator species for benthic macrovertebrates and metals. And that's because not like laboratory experiments like bioassays have found that, that yes, the uh, metals can cause toxicity of those organisms. But also um, a lot of the uh, mayflies that we have in our Western streams are clingers. That's their life habitat. That's their, that's their niche. And what clinger means is they like to cling to smooth, uh, clean rock surfaces. And, um, and when those metals precipitate out, as I mentioned before, it basically eliminates that habitat. And so really we looked at, at look at mayflies to see if we see any impacts. Here's what it looks like uh, last year in the animus. And here's where cement creek comes into the animus. And these are miles, so a mile upstream of cement creek. So these sites up here would not be affected by the Gold King, whereas these sites are all affected by the Gold King. And what you see from last year is these are the number of mayfly species, and you see four, four, three upstream, and then all of a sudden, after Cement Creek, this prolonged um, years and years of mine drainage has really decimated the mayfly population. And then it rebounds as you get further and further from, from
from that source. And so what we'll be looking for in the data is things like this to see if maybe this species disappeared um, from these sites and if it impacted these populations. This is a question. I haven't shared this data. We just got it back. Um, we're still analyzing it, but I'm pretty much through analyzing it and can say you guys are the first to, to hear this. So let's see. There's basically, as I mentioned, I have tissue samples from 2014 and 2015 uh, for benthic macroinvertebrates. And you can see the, the gray vert is before the gold king and the black is afterwards. And if you look at these, what I've circled here in orange, those are all sites that would be affected by the gold king. This green site here, Elk Creek, Cascade Creek, these aren't on the animus. They're tributaries that wouldn't be affected. And this is upstream of where the gold king came in. And so you can see little change here, or it, these actually the 2014 had higher copper, is what we're looking at, than this year. But these sites that were affected by the Gold King all have much higher concentrations of copper in their tissue than, uh, than last year. So really interesting, and perhaps even more interesting, is this pattern doesn't hold up for any other metal that we looked at. Copper is the only one that we saw being bioaccumulated or taken up by benthic macroinvertebrates and potentially bioaccumulated to other organisms. So just to kind of place this in historical context, um, was this an unprecedented event? Not really. Um, we've had historic mine blowouts that, that actually caused more, at least acute damage. Um, there was actually a blowout in 2013 that nobody talked about because it occurred at a time when the river was running at a higher level and so it didn't change the color and, and went mostly unnoticed. And then, in, I don't know if any, has anybody read the High Country News? There's a great article on, on the Animus River and the Gold King that occurred that you guys should go check out if you haven't read it. He does a great job of putting the historical context of, of this event. But in the 70s, there was a, another uh, event where a mine waste pile basically uh, kind of blew out and got eroded into the river and, and similarly Parks and Wildlife put some fish cages in and all the fish died in Durango. So we've actually had things that happen like this before and, and I think that what it speaks to is really we have a hundred more than a hundred years of impacts from legacy mining to deal with. The Gold King is just one it's a terrible thing, don't get me wrong, but in the larger context of what's been going on for a long time, we've got a lot to try to deal with. Um, for example, this is, um, this is a historical data set. You can see all the blue lines. That's the hydrograph every year going back to 2001. This is for copper. Um, so all these green data, this is uh, collected by a program called Riverwatch over the past 10, 20 years. And here's our data over here. The red is actually concentrations of copper we saw during the, the Gold King plume and the orange is, is during afterwards in the months of September. And you can see that during the plume, those were unprecedented values, at least that we've captured in that river watch data. They were much higher than anything we've ever seen before. So that's, but these are only monthly samples. There's lots of things we could have missed. And the fact that there's a bunch of samples up here that have high concentrations of copper that are kind of on this low end of, of the plume tells you that I think we have a larger problem than we realize. Here's aluminum in a similar manner. Again, orange and red is stuff we observed, and then this is the historical data set. So there are some high samples that, that we've seen in the past. Um, perhaps even more interesting is arsenic, where here's the highest we measured during this Gold King event. And we've got a bunch of samples here from uh, 2006, 2007, that we've detected higher arsenic levels in the past. So what do we know now and what we don't know quite yet? Um, we did see water quality exceedances during the plume, not during the storm events, but we did see elevated metals again in those storm events. And we're really worried about spring runoff and, and what we're gonna see there. Um, we did see the initial survival of fish and, and benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, we've documented an increase in the uptake of copper in, as, in 2015 as compared to 2014. 
and we're really shortly going to have a whole lot more data and analysis on, on the bug community. Um, I don't know if anyone's been following the news, but um, since then, they basically are treating the, the Gold King mine water now. EPA has uh, put in a, a temporary treatment facility up there that's supposed to go through the winter, and I think they've extended it now. And then today is Wednesday. On Monday of uh, this week, two days ago, the county, San Juan County, where Silverton is located, and the town of Silverton unanimously voted to send a letter to the governor to request Superfund status for this, this area that had, had been a long-standing controversy and really a big deal. This is a big, a big change. And so Superfund status is likely coming to, uh, to this, this problem. And, and what that means for the communities and actually fixing the problem is still a debate worth having. Treatment. Yeah. So the way you typically treat mine drainage, I'm not an engineer or chemist, so I'm going to give it to you as basic as I can. So the water, you basically have to raise the pH of the level of the water to get the metals to precipitate out and to be a solid. So you basically want to get them out of a dissolved state into a solid state to remove them from the water. So the way you do that in the past is you add lime to the water that raises the pH and then solids separate out and then you have to deal with the solids, clean them up and then ship them out somewhere and, to, and get rid of them. And it's really expensive. And so this treatment facility they have now um, would have to run forever and it costs a million dollars a year. And it's only treating the Gold King, it's not treating any of the other drainage mines. So that's what the treatment is. And it's also just shifting it someplace else. <laughs> yes, and then it ends up somewhere. Hopefully not in a waterway, but it's true. And, and so another avenue we'll be pursuing with monitoring, in addition to spring runoff, is, is trying to figure out the effectiveness of, tr of treatment like that. We know it's effective at the site. It's actually removing 90% of zinc from the water right there, but we don't know how that translates to downstream effectiveness. And to keep uh, going with that, exactly as I just said, spring runoff we're going to be monitoring. Um, we're trying to figure out the, the effectiveness of treatment upstream and how that translates to our aquatic life and water quality in Durango and, and downstream. We're going to continue macroinvertebrate surveys because even just two years of data isn't enough. We really need to know what's going to happen to the next generation and the next generation and see if these treatment uh, methods are able to, to bump that population up. And another thing I'd like to tell you about is is that we're involved with is a, is a large kind of collaborative effort in Durango called the Animus River Community Forum. And it's basically stakeholders from multiple counties and mul multiple towns and multiple le levels of government trying to get together and collaborate and communicate together about how we should move forward as a community, the message that we can get to the public about human health and kind of a cohesive monitoring strategy so that we're not kind of stepping on each other's toes. So that's going on, uh, on now and as a result of the Gold King. The other thing I, I hope it comes from the Gold King and the, and the media that it, and the attention it got is just a greater awareness of the legacy of mining and, and the impacts to water quality. Because it's not just in the Animus, it's watersheds, especially in Colorado, but all over the world, really. And uh, if we can come up with a better treatment method, we'll be in a better shape to solve the problem. And just so that we're transparent, uh, we did do all of our work independently, but we do receive funding from the Environmental Protection Agency, Trout Unlimited, the Stakeholders Group, uh, Animus River Watershed Partnership, and various other partnerships and community support. And we are still seeking funding to, to kind of hammer down some of our spring sampling and beyond. And we may go crowdsourcing with some of the sampling efforts. Um, there's a lot of the spotlight on this event has has moved elsewhere, and so we're still seeking funding sources to move forward. The EPA is still funding. So from this point, I'd love to have lots of questions and discussion, and um, we'll take a few minutes to do that, but we really need to use this microphone so that it's captured on the screen. So who would like to go first? Any question or comment? Great presentation. 
How believable are those water quality standards that you cited? How well understood are the effects of heavy metal? I think that's a great question. They're based, some of them are, I think, good, and some of them are not good. Um, for example, uh, lead and iron, I believe, are um, based on single species toxicity uh, in laboratory assessments, and they're not really comprehensive of a across a, a, a large diversity of aquatic species, for example. So I think there, there's a lot of room for uh, more research in that. And there's been some recent studies that found that actually for aquatic life, zinc, for example, is actually a pretty good water quality standard, what the EPA has, has defined. But copper, they are arguing, is not stringent enough. And that actually when you approach that copper standard, they were seeing uh, decreases in the abundance of insects in particular. And so I think that they all can be used, taken with a grain of salt. Um, the agricultural standards, for example, I think haven't been updated in quite a while, in a number of years, and, and they really should be readdressed, I think. So I would stress that we use those water quality standards as kind of a benchmark, just for perspective, perspective just to put something in perspective. Because it's really hard to assess you know, the exposure pathways of, of metals in a water media to humans or aquatic life. There's a lot of research that still could be done. Thanks. Um, we called your office, I don't know, a month or six weeks ago or something, and they said, whoever we talked to, said that um, the water quality was actually better now than it had been before the spill. Is that accurate? And how do you respond? I think that, that sounds like a misunderstanding. I, I apologize if, if somebody conveyed that message. I don't think that it's better than it was before. I think it's better than it was during the peak of that plume. But no, I don't think it's better than it was pre prior to the event. Sorry if that was a, a miscommunication. Hi, I have a question. I'm familiar with um, West Virginia, the um, Friends of the Chief um, group, and um, when they had the acid mine drainage, drainage um, incident back in the 70s, it killed a lot of the wildlife because it increased the minerals in the water and just destroyed a lot of the wildlife that's just now starting to reproduce. And that's mm -hmm. three plus decades ago. Mm. Is this similar, what's going on in the Animus, mm. as it was with the, um, the cheat, as well as are the other mines using acid to, um, did they use acid for the mining process? A couple of things. Just to clarify, uh, it's actually not, the, the acid isn't from the mining process. It's actually a naturally occurring process that happens when water and oxygen interact with, with metals that are in rock. And so when they interact, the pH lowers and then it keeps cascading and more metals get leached out into the water. Um, I'm not as familiar with the cheat, but I think that the difference would be that in Durango, we, again, we didn't see like a large kill of fish or insects yet. Um, however, again, I'm talking about Durango and that's 60 miles downstream of where the gold can occurred. Um, so it, it is, I'm just starting to get through the samples from, from higher up to be able to speak to that. Uh, I have samples for clo that are much closer to the gold king that I'm still analyzing. Um, I think that, that maybe what is, is different in this event is that, that we've had 100 years of, of metals coming down, and I forget who, who asked the question earlier, but you know, it could be that, that, that the organisms that occupy these rivers at this point are accustomed to these kind of low-level chronic exposure to metals over the past 100 years. As I mentioned before, in the 70s there was an event that killed all the fish, and they've come back. So I th one thing, there's two things. One, I think that we, there's still a lot we don't know. We don't know really the magnitude of this event yet for long term. We know that everything wasn't killed immediately. Um, and secondly, nature is really resilient. That's what I learned. I was really surprised standing on that bridge in the middle of the night and watching the river turn that color. I thought everything was going to die. Yeah. And it's, it's impressive that things can ha hold on through, through events like that. We got a question right here. Does the Elvis flow into a lake downstream? 
example? The animus flows into. Uh, uh, it doesn't directly flow into a lake. Uh, there's a new reservoir that pulls water from the animus called Lake Night Horse. That's a. It's downstream of Durango. That's a whole another can of worms. But it does flow into the San Juan River. <laughs> And then from the San Juan River, it ends up in Lake Powell. Is anybody monitoring? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask if anybody was monitoring in Lake Powell, but I was also going to ask, is anybody monitoring alongside you? Or are you the only ones that are doing this? Uh, the, the people are monitoring Lake Powell. Um, I believe it's probably the Environmental Protection Agency and maybe I don't know if the states are doing that, but I haven't looked at that data, to be honest with you. And yes, other people are monitoring. I think I showed a little bit of the Southern Ute Indian Tribes data, which is a small tribe that's located just downstream of Animus. In Ignacio, yes, very good water quality program there. They do some, some of the best monitoring, I believe, in, in, in the counties that we, that we live in, and, and they have a very robust program, and, and they're open to discussions about some of their results, and, and we we're finding similar things. And they're going to continue monitoring some in the, in the spring, as is the EPA, as I don't think the state plans to continue monitoring it more than they normally do. But everybody's frequency that is being proposed right now, in my opinion, is not frequent enough. I think that we'll miss some of the nuances of storm events if we don't really pay attention and have people on the ground locally that are ready to mobilize at any, any notice. For example, just last week, the, uh, as the snow is starting to melt, warm temperatures we've had, the river turned kind of, not orange, but orange-yellow. But it's hard now because don't all rivers in the spring turn a little brown? And, and it's like, how do you train your eye to really know? So we started getting a lot of phone calls and Facebook posts of, are you guys monitoring? Is the river okay? And, and so we have been sampling again, and we, and we did sample that event, and, and the sample's in the lab, and we'll find out soon enough. Mm -hmm. Is that something that's going to stay with the bugs, or do you think they eventually... Well, the, most of those bugs that probably are in those samples uh, only live months to a year. Um, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, those insects would only live months to a year. So, so it could potentially be that they get eaten and that the next insects go back to that 2014 level, and it won't be as high in, in the next generation, or it could be. I'm not sure. You know, it, they, they take in those metals uh, multiple pathways, the water, the sediment that they live in, and then the algae that they eat or, or whatever they're eating. Um, two quick questions. Um, do we have any information on the event from the 70s to maybe compare if it was just an adaptation process of these organisms, or was there more metals or more sediment that could have caused the, the difference. And the other just question is, I in the beginning you showed the slide that um, said that they linked metals in, on the river to just four of the mines. And I was curious how they could make this link. Is it an isotope, different features of like that they can tag the metals? Let's see, the first question, Oh, yes, was about the 70s fish kill. Thank you. My attention span. Anyway, so uh, that's a great question, and it would be great if there was data. And there must be somewhere, and I haven't seen it. The only piece of information I've seen that tells you about, for example, that fish kill incident was from our local newspaper. It was published. So it's a, a newspaper article from the 70s that, that actually Jonathan Thompson, who works for High Country News, also put in his article if you want to go pull that article and kind of brush up. He has a great overview there. And the other question was, yes, I believe that what they did was um, measure the load, so the amount of metal over volume over time that was in the river. And then they measured actually the, the metal load that was coming from each of the mines, the 186 mines, and then just added them up to see who, what was contributing the most. I know that they've also gone in and, and done some, uh, I don't know if it's isotopes, to be honest with you. There's another tracer type study that, that has been done uh, and that came to 
I believe, similar conclusions. But good, good question. So awesome that you're here, Scott. And I know that if anybody else has any questions, Scott's happy to stick around. And thanks so much for coming. And next week, we'll continue to talk about rivers with Tamarisk Coalition. So come on back. Thank you, Thank you folks.